our previous presentation, we talked about the migration of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina and what that means theologically in the Islamic understanding of the necessary political mechanisms that is needed to bring about the will of God on earth. That migration is the hijrah. That is the, that is the hijrah, that movement, that journey from Mecca to Medina. In our next section, I want to comment more on what that means theologically. But uh, we just touched on it rather carefully uh, in the last session. And now we want to look at a different journey, the journey that Jesus took. Um, Jesus um, was uh, in Galilee preaching extensively. And uh, at one point he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Or who do people that say that I am? Well, you're a prophet or you're Elijah returned to earth or something like that. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We believe in our sure, you're Christ, the son of the, of the living God. And Jesus was a euphoric. There's going to be a church. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You have not come to this conclusion on your own, but God himself has revealed this to you. And that's why we're here today as a group of Christians concerned about walking faithfully with Jesus in the context of Muslim communities in which we live and work. And uh, it's that conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that leads us into the church and leads us into the commitments to the Christian journey. Uh, shortly after that, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Elijah and Moses appeared in a cloud, and only three of his disciples were with him on that mount. And um, then uh, all at once, and, and Elijah and Moses are talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what they're talking about on that mountain. And then all at once they're, they've disappeared. Only Jesus is there and this voice comes from heaven. You are my beloved son, listen to him. Which is to say that Jesus supersedes all the prophets. He does not abrogate them. Elijah and Moses are on the mountain, but he has the last word. Listen to him. Elijah and Moses were there, but now it's Jesus standing there at the center. And so, both the transfiguration and Peter's confession uh, center in who Jesus is and his authority, his power, his saving work. That's what that's all about. And now it's not only the disciples that are being increasingly impressed with Jesus and who he is. All of Galilee is being impressed by Jesus. This happened especially after he fed 5,000 men plus women and children miraculously by breaking bread and break five loaves of bread and two small fish. I suppose it was 20,000 people. The scriptures say 5,000 men plus women and children. I mean, it's an enormous event. And so it's not just Peter and the disciples, you know, who are becoming impressed with Jesus. All of Galilee is being impressed with him. This feeding of the 5,000 is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts of Jesus, which means it's very important. If an event is recorded in all four gospels, you can be sure that the early church perceived this is truly significant. Now in John's gospel, after the feeding of the 5,000, the Galileans came and by force attempted to make him become their king. It's not just that he they came and said, Jesus, <laughs> we have a thought, would you consider, please, becoming our king? Would you, we, 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 we'd like to offer that to you if you're ready to accept it. No, it says by force. I suppose they actually surrounded him with soldiers <laughs> and with their weapons. <laughs> and Jesus, become our king. And it's a grand plan. You see, up there in Galilee, they were fighting against the polytheistic Roman imperial powers. They wanted to establish the kingdom of God in Galilee. And it's a grand plan because there in Galilee, they would establish a Dar al-Christian. Muhammad, 600 years later, established a Dar al-Islam, a region under Islamic rule there in Medina. The plan would be that in Galilee, you would establish now a region under Christ's rule for his God to be the Messiah. All the Galileans believe that after feeding these 5,000. 
And isn't the Messiah going to extend the rule of God to the ends of the earth? So from Galilee, he could begin to bring that about, and he would lead their armies. There were zealots in Galilee fighting an underground guerrilla army, secret army, fighting against the Romans. Jesus would become the general in that zealot army, and he would just feed the soldiers by breaking bread miraculously, you know, and with his miracle working powers, he could strike the Romans blind, and he established God. It's a grand plan, a grand plan. And what does Jesus say? Yes, I'll do it. He absolutely refused that invitation. This invitation, brothers and sisters, is exactly the same invitation Muhammad received in Mecca when the Medinans came to him. The same invitation. Muhammad accepted the invitation. Jesus said no. Absolutely no. He left them immediately. This happened right after the feeding of the 5,000, according to John's Gospel. And then he went, into, he went into the hills, and he spent the night in prayer alone. And later he meets with the disciples, and he says, we have a journey to make, and the journey is to Jerusalem. In Luke's Gospel, we read that from that time on, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem resolutely set his face. And he says to the disciples, in Jerusalem, they're going to arrest me. They will spit upon me. They will beat me. They will mock me. And they will crucify me. And Peter says, that's impossible. You are the Christ, the Son of God. The Christ cannot suffer. Read the scriptures. The Christ lives forever. Jesus, get this idea out of your head. There can't be a crucifixion awaiting you. You're the Christ. And Jesus rebukes Peter very sharply. He said, you're thinking the thoughts of man and not the thoughts of God. In fact, he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You see, the cross makes no sense within the world system. It is simply foolishness. But we read Paul's, through Paul's pen inspired by the Holy Spirit that the cross is, which is foolishness to the world, is the power of God. And so Jesus face, heads on now to Jerusalem. And uh, it's, it's a long journey. He doesn't rush it. He's taking, it's not a long journey in terms of miles, but... Um, he doesn't rush it. They, they, they're teaching and preaching and, and performing miracles as he goes and um, wending his way slowly southward from Galilee to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and finally, he gets to the outskirts of Jerusalem. And he gets on a colt and rides that colt into the city. So let's just imagine, here's Jesus on the colt. And he rides up over the Mount of Olives, and he sees the city of Jerusalem on the plateau beneath him. And um, Jesus, be and, and, and the children have now gathered around this colt riding Jesus, and they're singing hosannas to the son of David. They're just euphoric. Now, why are the children so happy, and why is Jesus riding this colt? But to get the answer, we need to turn to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. You see, the children had their Sabbath schools, where they would study the Old Testament prophets. And all the children surely knew this scripture. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. Oh, so when the king comes, when the Messiah arrives, he will ride into Jerusalem on a colt, you see. So when Jesus gets on this colt, why, uh, all the children are simply filled with joy. 
because they know Jesus is proclaiming in that colt ride that he is the Messiah who was promised, and the children love Jesus. So that's why they're gathering around Jesus, singing all of these hosannas. But what kind of kingdom is he going to establish? In our churches, we often don't read verse 10 on Palm Sunday when we celebrate the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem. But look at verse 10. Verse 9 says he will ride the colt. Verse 10 describes his kingdom. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. His kingdom is the kingdom of peace, which has nothing to do with the weapons of warfare. He will break the weapons of warfare. He will do away with the chariots of war. He will do away with the horses of war. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His peace will extend to the whole world, but it's voluntarily proclaimed. It is not a peace forced on anybody. And so when Jesus gets to the brow of the hill here, of the Mount of Olives, and he sees Jerusalem down there on the plateau below him, Jesus begins to cry. The children are singing, and Jesus is weeping. Why is he weeping? Because Jerusalem will not receive the peace. That's why he's crying. You see? And then he goes into the city, and he cleanses the temple and so forth. We'll talk more about that in the next session. But he meets with the disciples. And by the way, what I'm sharing this morning now is what I shared when I spoke to these mullahs in Iran. This is what I shared with them. That after that cult ride, where he's proclaiming that he is bringing peace to all nations, but a peace having nothing to do with military power, Jesus then met with the disciples for the Last Supper. And at that supper, Jesus reveals that Judas is going to betray him. What does he do? Jesus gets a piece of bread and dips it into the broth and hands it to Judas. I mean, this is what a bride and groom do at a wedding. Feed each other cake, that kind of thing. Giving someone food from your own plate, your own dish, is to say, I want to be your intimate friend. Jesus takes that bread, dips it in the broth, and hands it to Judas, who's going to betray him. Imagine. This is the Messiah, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. How do kings treat betrayers? Treat betrayers. Jesus then gets up from the table and he gets a, a, a basin of water. And as we see how they're sitting, it seems likely that he went to Judas first. And he kneels with that basin of water and he washes the feet of the betrayer. Imagine. And then he washes the feet of each disciple. And then he frees Judas to go and do what he wants to do. My, 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 my. We talked yesterday that Jesus is the incarnation of the word. He's God with us. The whole universe is created and sustained through the word of God. Jesus is the incarnation of that word. He washes the feet of the betrayer. And then that evening, out in the garden, they go into the garden, the Mount of Olives, they were outside of Jerusalem, and Jesus is in prayer and all that, the disciples sleeping and some praying and so forth. And then the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, led by Judas. Judas goes and kisses Jesus. Jesus. And Peter, Peter determined that if ever there was a time for a just use of the sword, it is now. You know, we're saying our Muslim friends use the sword as a last resort, the jihad theme, the last resort after everything else fails. This is a last resort. I mean, if ever there was a case for jihad, it's now. And Peter gets his, gets his sword, and, and I believe he intended to slice, he, he, he attacked the servant of the high priest. I think he intended to slice that servant of the high priest in two from top to bottom. Bah! But Peter was not good with the sword. 
He only caught his ear. That's all. And Jesus says, Peter, put away your sword. Put away your sword. The kingdom has nothing to do with the sword. Put it away. If I wanted swords, I could call 70,000 angels to come and protect me, but I won't do it. And he picks up that ear from the ground, puts it back where it had been cut off, and heals that ear miraculously right there. Heals the servant of the high priest, the one who's come to arrest him. Heals him. And then he goes to trial and a most farce of a trial, most unjust trial. And they beat him and flog him and spit upon him and mock him. They derision, put a crown of thorns on him. He said, if you're the king, okay, be the king, there's your crown. And then he carries his own cross out to Golgotha, outside of Jerusalem. He was so weary he could not carry it. A African was then from, from Libya, was, um, was uh, called upon to help. He helps Jesus carry that cross. Africans often talk about that. So when Jesus could not carry the cross, one of our people stepped forward to help him carry that cross and goes out there to the hill on Golgotha and he is nailed to that cross between two thieves. And so in those outstretched arms, that man on the cross with outstretched arms, all the hatred and vengeance and, um, and um, rebellion of the world go crashing into him on that cross. And what does he do? Oh, God, curse these people. No, 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 no. On that cross, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. And in that cry, we are forgiven. And in his resurrection, he meets the disciples and he says to them, look at the prints of the nails in my hand. Look at the peace I purchased for you. Receive my peace. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And so the mission of the church is to extend the peace of Christ to all nations. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. We can't do it on our own. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to bring this about. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. That's the journey to the cross. It's a journey that takes us in the opposite direction from the hijra. It does. It does. After my message to the gathering of probably 1,500 mullahs and ayatollahs there in Iran, um, the chairperson said, we didn't know this about Jesus. We should start to investigate. And he said, you Christians, open up your books and your archives so we can read these books that Schenck is referring to. And God bless the dear man. The books I was referring to are all in the Bible, like Zechariah and so forth, you know. But he said, we need to start investigating these insights about Jesus. For truly, it is astonishing good news. And then around the corners of that auditorium, I am told that people said, hmm, how strange that Shank is a man of peace. You would think he would be a Muslim. You see how the Christian message has gotten so distorted around the world, including in the understandings of the Iranian Muslims, that they would think a man of peace could hardly be a Christian. You see, it shows how far the church has so often strayed from the way of the cross. Any questions or comments? I was going to ask about were there uh, questions in the minds of Muslims about the Crusades? Because what you presented is contrary to what happened when the Crusades, uh, in the time of Crusades, because it wasn't peace um, bringing from Christians, it was this sword and wars and like. Uh, 
You know, I sometimes am on the verge of weeping as I talk with Muslims. And the way in which the Constantinian use of the cross has so distorted the understanding of the gospel that people would think the cross is a symbol indicating that Christians should slay Muslims. That's what they often think. We sometimes say the cross is offensive to Muslims. Why is it offensive? It is most often offensive because in their minds it conjures up war against Muslims. And that's not what the cross is about at all. Oh my, may God forgive the church when we distort it in this way. The cross is about Jesus, hands outstretched, God with us on that cross. The Christ, the Son of God. <laughs> and as all that hate comes in, comes crashing into him, he cries out in forgiveness. And in those outstretched arms, we are invited to forgiveness and to reconciliation. That's what the cross is about. It's love for the enemy. My, my. How we have distorted it so often. May God help us to repent. Yes. What if uh, Muslims will uh, start reading the Karaya? Uh, chapter 10, and then read uh, verse chapter 9, and then they will read verse 10 back to us. They will say, what the greater power Jesus will use to destroy the weapons and the, and, and the horses and everything, he will use the power to destroy all of the military we uh, built so far. And also they might say, you Christians, you are not true followers of Christ. Uh, you Western Christian use the military power all over the world, even in our land. What we would reply? And and the first the first reference was from where? Uh, it's uh, Zechariah nine, uh, verse ten. Yes. That uh, Jesus uh, will destroy the the, the the weapons of war and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he will use the power to, to destroy. It. Oh well, it is the power of truth. It's the power of truth. You know, it is the power of the cross. Love triumphs over the use of violence. That he, he does away with these weapons of war through the power of truth, you see. Love the enemy, what do you need a weapon for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have no gun in my house <laughs> to protect myself. You know, why would I want a gun when I'm to love my enemy? You see, so the power of truth, the power of the truth of the gospel does away with the weapons of war. Now, granted, very often, we horrendously distort the gospel. And so, yes, what about all the uh, ways in which Christians champion the use of military force and so forth? And um, um, maybe I will, um, I, will, I will just share with you a bit uh, a response which I encountered in Indonesia. I was, uh, this book, the, the dialogue, was translated into Indonesian to try to build bridges of understanding between Muslims and, and Christians in central Indonesia, where there had been violent conflict between Christians and Muslims, actually. So they translated this book to try to build understanding. And they invited me to come to Indonesia um, for the official launching of the book, my wife and I, and others were there as well. So we had 80 Muslim and Christian leaders together for the official launching of the book. And the Muslim leader gave a nice speech, and then they asked me to give a speech. So I gave a little talk about the way of the cross being the way in which we walk. Um, and uh, that's my commitment to peacemaking, the way of the cross. And that's the kingdom of Jesus Christ I seek to represent. At the back of the room where Olga is sitting, a, um, a young woman stood up when question time came and asked your question. Why do you say that Christians love their enemies? We don't experience it that way. For example, we see the United States as a very warlike country. Um, your President Bush, who claims to be an evangelical Christian, has taken you into a war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So what you're saying doesn't compute with how we observe Christians to actually function. What do you say about that? And the moderator said, that's a terrible question to ask our guests from America. Um, let's be more polite than that. <laughs> I said, no, but I said, it's a very good question. And I meet it everywhere I go. Thank you for the question. And this is what I said. You can disagree with me. I speak from within the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition, as you know. Um, and I said to them, um, thank you for the question. I said, I do not seek to represent all Christians in America. There's great diversity, just as there is great diversity in the Muslim movement here in Indonesia. 
very diverse movement. And they all chuckled. They know that there's great diversity in their own movement. But I said, I speak within a tradition known as Anabaptist. It goes back to the 17th century, to the, to the 16th century. And as these brothers and sisters were reading the Bible, they saw that Jesus calls us to love the enemy. At that time, Europe was at war with the Muslims. The Ottoman Turks had laid siege to Vienna. And all of Europe was at war. And um, I said, this group of believers, they're studying the New Testament. They said, well, Jesus would not fight the Muslims. He would love them. And so they refused to participate in those wars. And that was treason. That's one reason many Anabaptists were martyred for that reason. And that's the tradition out of which I speak. The conviction that Jesus and his way loves the enemy. So in Iraq, are people trying to help working at peacemaking teams, you know? Not in the military, but in peacemaking teams, trying to build bridges. That's our calling. Now I said, the question is, how does that kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is based upon the love revealed in the cross, relate to the state? And governments and the state do use weapons, and they go to war. It doesn't surprise us. That happens. So when nations go to war, as is happening now, I'm not surprised at all. It's the way nations often function. But that's not the kingdom of Jesus Christ. How we live within the kingdom of Christ and also participate in the state is a difficult question that Christians always struggle with. As for me, I'm committed to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And if that kingdom is in conflict with the state, then I stand with Jesus' kingdom. And that kingdom is eternal. And that's the kingdom out of which I am bearing witness. I said before the war in Iraq began, our churches across America wrote a letter. 7,000 people signed that letter. We took it to George Bush. We begged him with 7,000 signatures. It was that thick, so many signatures. Begged him, don't do it. We were not heard, but we tried. We should have done more. May God forgive us for not doing more, but we tried. But a letter that thick was taken to the White House. And I'm told, I learned later, that this little speech of mine was broadcast on national television. <laughs> And they said, the whole nation saw you say that we took a letter that thick. And they said, even the Hezbollah militant says, thank God if there's that kind of a witness in the world. Yeah, yeah. That's our calling, you know. And I realize that the issues are very complex, how we relate to government, to state, to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You work at that in your theological schools and so forth. But it's what I shared within that particular context. Um, then right after that, we met with the Hezbollah in Indonesia, the Hezbollah, and, um, and their commander, and had another launching for the book in the context of the Hezbollah. And um, when we sat down in a circle, they said, you must know our mission. Our mission is to kill our enemies and fight to defend Islam. This sort of jihadist mission. And truly, the Hezbollah had burnt churches and even pastors have been killed. We all know that. It's in the news occasionally. Not recently, but there's some, some, some several years ago. And so we're sitting with them now. And I said, may I respond? They said, sure. I said, the problem is when we kill our enemies, we make more enemies. But Jesus shows us another way, love your enemy, then you don't have an enemy. And they, they look, oh, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting thought, <laughs> you see. <laughs> and then Paulus, the pastor, who had arranged for this meeting with the Hezbollah, we were all sitting in a circle, and he is sitting beside the Hezbollah commander. And he gives the commander a copy of this book, the dialogue, in Indonesian now. And the commander begins to page through it. And the man begins to weep. The commander. Now see, the Hezbollah, like I say, in Indonesia, they've been involved in some, some things which have caused the Christians a lot of concern, like burning churches and that kind of thing. And this is, this is their commander, sitting there beside the pastor, and he's weeping. And the pastor is sitting beside him and patting him on the shoulder. And I nearly wept because I knew in patting him on the shoulder, the pastor was saying, we have forgiven you. We've forgiven you. <laughs> Be at peace. We've forgiven you. When he stopped weeping, he said, I'm weeping because this book is showing another way. We have thought that the way to defend Islam is to fight to defend Islam. And look, this book is showing another way to respectfully bear witness to your faith, but to respect those who disagree. And if we would live this way in Indonesia, our whole society would be transformed. Please give me 50 copies of this book 
for all of my commanders to read. I asked Paulus, the pastor, how do you interpret this transformation in this man and in these Hezbollah leaders? He says, lots of cups of tea. <laughs> and he adds, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit. This Paulus, for a couple years, had been developing relationships with that commander. Knocked on his door. What do you want? A cup of tea with you. Next week he's back again. What do you want? Another cup of tea. Developing those relationships, you see, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's our calling. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.